And I found these little bottles here, which you could use to make a little bud vase. Just drill a hole and put that in there. These are plastic. And it was uh, $2.50 for six of them. The uh, test tube that I used in that is a 16 millimeter, which is 5 eighths outside diameter. And uh, it was four bucks for three t glass tubes at Hobby Lobby. Or you can get the next size bigger, 20 millimeter, five bucks for four tubes. But if you sign up at Hobby Lobby, you get uh, coupons all the time for big discounts. Then they also have these bottles here, which I found, which you could also take a block of wood, take a portion of it, drill a big hole, a one inch hole up here to remove the lid, and put that inside a piece of wood to make a base that would hold more water. So that's some opportunity for this, this was uh, this was dollar forty nine with a sprayer in it. This bottle was ninety nine cents. And this one was sixty seven cents. It's uh, an inch and a half diameter with one inch neck and four and three quarter inches tall. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to turn this to do. All right, <clears throat> let's start out with. Uh, a roughing gouge and get the corners off. Let me have my smock, please. Chips just want to go everywhere. Put this wire behind you, Jack. No, let's put it inside. Leave it where you had it. Yeah, leave it where you had it. All right. Now, kids. I'll just zip this up and protect the microphone and it should still work. Is there anybody here who has not done any turning at all? Okay. The lathe is one of the safest power tools there is. The wood's turning, your tool is standing still, but you can still have problems and nicks and so safety is always important. And when you first turn into learning to turn, this is what's called dead center. And I would call them a safety drive. They used to use them over here before we got the live centers. So you can use that to turn. And if you get a catch, it will just slip. So. And then I'll just put a little bit of pressure on it, and I'll get enough friction to turn it. I haven't used that because it's the right size for that hole. The hole is not perfectly centered in the block, but when I get through turning, it will. Yeah, and, senior moment. Um, I'm just trying to take a safety. Tool rest. Tool rest. Well, yeah, you always, when you put a piece out in there, you always turn it by hand all the way around to make sure it's not going to hit the tool rest. The tool rest should be just a little bit below center, but that really depends on your height. If the lathe is higher, you can move it down. If you're taller, you can move the tool rest up because it's a round piece that you're working on. Um, let me do a little turning on here, and Wes, maybe you can talk to him a little bit about safety. Or to the group, why I do a little turning on it. My, my mind is on here. Alright, what's going on here? Alright, well, I'm, I'm going to put my hand over top of this so I can keep the chips from going all over. Here. for, particularly when you're sanding, when you're just turning, it's not too much of a problem. But when you start sanding and that dust, it can get in your lungs and really cause you serious problems. And Don Bedell had a real problem with Coca-Bola 
and that's quite similar to a poison ivy in the effect that it have on you. And it didn't affect him for quite a while, and then all of a sudden he broke out and got seriously allergic to it. So now I'm going to rub the bevel and use this like you would a skew. Can you get it on this side here? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Okay. If I use the tool just like this, it's just scraping the wood off. If I turn it up a little bit more like this, it's more cutting it. But when I turn this at an angle, so the wood is sliding across the sharp, I then get a nice clean cut. Now, I did not loosen that. That is coming in the other way once So, I, I rubber, right there, I'm rubbing the bevel. You can see it slightly burnishing the wood. And then I just slightly pick up and it's going to start cutting. But when I bring it over this way, so the wood is sliding across the sharp at an angle, you, and now you can see it's burnishing the wood too because I'm rubbing the bevel. And so I'm getting a much cleaner cut. Now one thing I want to, and you can see the shavings are curly rather than just like sawdust. Now one thing I need to do, I need to get fairly thin where these hearts are so that the you can really see through there and you can see the vial with the stems in it. But if this is going to connect to the lidded box and then I'm going to have a piece on the top to capture the end. So I'm going to leave both those a little bit bigger diameter. Bed, so you want to go from larger to smaller diameter. If I go the other way uphill, I'm going to tear the wood out because I'm going to get underneath the fibers and lift them out and tear them out. When I go down hill, I have to cut through the fibers and then I get a clean cut. one tool that we want really, really sharp, and we sharpen it with a diamond stone after we grind it. And it's called a skew because it's at an angle, the sharp is at an angle, and you use it this so you, it's A, B, C, A, anchor it on the tool rest, B, put the bevel on there, and then C, rotate into your cut. And you can probably see that that's burnishing it and getting a much cleaner cut than I was with the... I better check my thickness there that I... Yeah. I don't go too thin. No, I'm good there. Will the hearts distort as you cut them? Will the heart distort? No. 
Well, as I left an angle across the heart, uh, no, not really. As long as it's centered on the shaft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as long as they're centered on the hole. <coughs> if they're not centered on the hole, then they'll look, won't look good. You just did something that always makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. You just did something that always makes me nervous is to start the cut off the end and, uh, or at the end. But you didn't see what I'm doing. I'm using this cone right here oh, yeah. to control the skew. Cause okay. I started mm -hmm. out, I'm rubbing the skew on that cone. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up and noticed that. As long as I don't put the sharp against that cone, I can get away with it. So if I put the sharp edge against the cone, then That'd be kind of hard on the tool. You want to take your watch off? Okay, I still sure. want to get that. Huh? You, think you want to take your watch off? That might be dangerous too. And it, yeah, well, you notice I don't wear any rings. <laughs> I haven't worn a wedding ring since the day I got married because I was in the service and in the electronics in the service and they wouldn't let you wear a ring. And so it got put in the drawer, and then when I went to put it back on, it didn't fit. We renewed our vows for our 40th wedding anniversary, and my wife bought me a new ring, and I don't want to mess it up, so it's in the drawer, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I know by this ring right here, yeah. Yeah. that I am married. <laughs> Anybody got any questions, feel free to just holler out. Are you, uh, are you going to put a uh, surface design? Yeah, I was Did planning on That's the next thing I was going to get into. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. How big of a hole did you put all the way through there, Jack? I put a 5 8 hole. Actually, it's a 6 32nd bigger than that. So, for, for the glass, the the glass tube. All right, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, texturing with this uh, Sorby mini texturing tool, the spiral on it. And to do that, I need to go down to the slowest RPM. Now, how many people here have a mini lathe? Most everybody. That looks easy to work on the jet. I like that. Uh, I've got a 10 and 12 inch mini lathe and then a big power matic. Sometimes I'll have something, one project I'll be working on using all three lathes. Uh, Alright, the secret of this tool, <coughs> this spiral on there, you have this at an angle, and there's a little scribe mark here and three little notches, and you just line it up with the notch. <coughs> and you've got to come back here on the tool rest, and you get it in there right lined up, and get it turning, and then you dip it down just a little bit and it will start cutting. <clears throat> and this, you, you, you can do it fast. So you're below center now, right? Just, just slightly. Actually, the top edge of this is what does the cutting. <clears throat> and, yeah, I've got some nice pattern right there now. Uh, and with it turned this way, I've got a pattern in one direction there. And rather than go deeper, I think I'm going to leave that, but I'm going to do a little bit. So if I go right at center and just 
gently go in there, it's going to find that groove that I was already in, <coughs> dip it down just a little bit, and then it'll start cutting. And then you don't want to advance it too fast. I have a question when you're done concentrating. Okay. <coughs> if, if, if you decided you wanted to come lower with your pattern, can you can you start and go either direction? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do that. I'm gonna now back up the other direction. Voila. So if you just approach the piece slowly. Well, it'll find it'll find the groove. And it, you you need it straight on first, and and gently let it go in there and find that point. Now, depending <laughs> on the diameter, sometimes you'll get a diameter that with this spacing won't work just right, and when it, it comes around to the next one, it's actually wanting to be in the center of it, and it will mess it up. So if you just cut that off, you change the diameter a little bit, and it'll probably go back to work. Now, I'm going to. Uh, Reverse this. It sprung back up by itself. Yeah, I see that. I'm going to reverse this and go in the other direction. <clears throat> what are you reversing? I'm just changing this tool recipe. I'll pass this around as soon as I'm through using it. There's a scribe line on the top, and then there's three little notches. The middle notch is straight level and then left or right angle. Did you buy that at Did you get that at I, I bought this up at Unicoi from uh, <clears throat> I craft supply here. Yeah. Uh, about everybody has them in their catalog. They might be here eventually. Consequences of turning too fast. Would be yeah, it will skip and jump. And right here, can you get in close on that? Mm -hmm. I'll try. Does it pull itself along as you do that, or do you have to? Pull no, it? you have to feed it. If you see right here, I've got a mark right in the middle of that. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to get. Well, I'm having a focusing problem if I get too close. Well, zoom in. I did. It's maximum. Oh. <laughs> That's as far as it'll go. <clears throat> Here, now, now see if you can focus in on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, those little lines there where it jumped <clears throat> yeah. when I went to larger diameter. Yeah. Double strike. I thought you meant to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not a design element? No, that's not a design element. So I'm going to go down <coughs> just a little bit. And now I can also go over this here and hopefully get a diamond pattern. So we'll see if we can do that. Let me try and pick this up. One thing I found with it going in the other direction, this little screw wants to unscrew. So I'm going to put my finger on it. To and this takes just a little bit of oil now and then on the shaft. You got a brass screw and a steel wheel with a polished center. There's no ball bearing in it. Alright, I'm going to see if I can pick up here and work into that and have a diamond pattern.
pass this around and can you change the cutting head on that? Yeah, you can get different cutter heads. And I've got some other tools that are really like a knurling tool for the lathe, but I didn't bring those. <coughs> they work better on softwood. Now a chatter tool that you can make yourself out of a piece of bandsaw blade or whatever really only works on end grain. Well that tool will work on end or side grain. Of course it works best with harder wood. I'm going to uh, hit that just a little bit with some sandpaper and then I'm going to put some sand mm -hmm. sealer on it. Yeah. <coughs> the, the cutting tool itself, the, 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 the round cutting tool, can that be sharpened or does that have to be replaced? No, you can sharpen it. You just let it spin in the lathe, hold your finger against it so it doesn't spin real quick, and uh, let it spin in the grinder. You just sharpen that top edge. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh. <coughs> I use death sanding sealer on everything I do on the lathe and I use it while it's on the lathe. Because it's sanding sealer, it's designed to be sanded and it will show up anything that's going to show up when you finish. Sanding sealer has solids in it, you need to shake it pretty good. And I get this at Lowe's. Um, And that's what it looked like with just a plain finish on it. Whoops. <laughs> this is lacquer. Lacquer right. sanding seal. And can you use the stuff out of a dip can, like a, a light bond? Yeah, you can use that too. And I and I I do have some of this in a gallon can that I bought that I've got in a glass jar with a brush that I use sometimes too and then put it on and wipe it off and actually polish it. And this vase right now has nothing but sanding sealer on it that I put on on the lathe and then I buffed it with a paper towel while I was running in the lathe. And I was going to put a finish on it, but I forgot and went ahead and glued this on in my hurry so that if I spray finish on it now, I'm, I'd have it in the windows here. So if I want to put anything on either, I've got to take that off and take the tube out or put a wipe on and brush on finish on it. Now, what I want to do now is go back, turn my speed up, and separate these patterns. Um, I forgot to bring a pencil. Anybody got a pencil? Yeah. Do it this way. I'll put a mark on my tool rest. Um, uh, does anybody like my portable tool holder here? The, the pipe unscrews, goes in the hole here, and this goes in the bucket, and it's all set to go for traveling. In your speed, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, what I want to do is cut off around the pattern and leave the pattern raised. And I want to eliminate, uh, <coughs> I think I might leave that like that, uh, where it's partially diamond and partially not diamond. Uh, give me that broom. Yeah, give me the broom, please. Uh, 
I was using DEF for my finish, but I've started using this Krylon clear acrylic I did at Walmart for three bucks. But it comes with a little white nozzle in here that puts out a round pattern. So I pry out that little white nozzle. I save the red nozzle from my DEF can. I drill that little hole out with a battery drill with a number 40 drill bit, and then I press in the red <laughs> insert, which gives you a fan pattern. On the DEF can, it comes with a fan pattern this way. If you leave it on that here, it hits on the edge and then you get drift, so you need to rotate it so your pattern is this way. And I did a base. Uh, bases, I usually put on lathe to finish them because I, I spray and turn and spray and turn and I don't get runs. If you were to take something like this and set it up vertical and spray it, you invariably get runs. But with it that way, you can see, get the light reflecting across, you can see how much you're putting on there. But I did a vase, and I put five heavy coats of this on it in early afternoon. I took it down to Highland for uh, <coughs> show and tell, came home, wet sanded it, and buffed it to a high finish. And that's how fast this stuff dries, and it dries harder and faster than death and it's perfectly clear where Def has an amber cast to it. Um, you used to say get the triple thick, but this is not the triple thick, right? No, this is not the triple thick. The triple thick goes on too heavy unless it's something flat. I use it when I want a fast coat on something flat, but most of the time, no. And the thing I like about this is there's no prep or clean up or anything. You just pick it up, use it, set it back down. Jake, do you ever use sanding sealer? before you put any kind of a finish on it? Yeah, because how many people have sanded something, you thought it was absolutely perfect, and you put the finish on it, and all of a sudden all this jumps out at you? <laughs> Does that happen to any of you? <laughs> okay. If you put the sanding sealer on there, anything that's going to jump out will jump out with the sanding sealer, but the <laughs> sanding sealer is designed to be sanded, and it also fills the pores. The other thing, if you were to take any piece of wood that you turn to sand and look under an under powerful enough microscope, it would look like a cotton ball. And you know what happens around here when we have a freezing rain? How the ice coats all the limbs on the trees and everything? Well, when you spray that sanding sealer on there, it does the same thing to those fibers. And then you can come back with sandpaper and knock them off and get rid of all those fuzzies. So then when you put your finish on there, you get a much better finish. An important thing to me too with sanding sealer, if you use multicolored woods, especially with Paduke or uh, uh, blood, heart, blood wood, mm -hmm. uh, and you have poly, it keeps it, it keeps the sand, the sawdust from contaminating the lighter colored woods. Not to say anything, Jack, but I thought that was important. I'm using a detailed spindle gouge and it really does not have the traditional bevel on it. It's rounded off kind of like a scoop and I'm using it most of the time like this so the sharp is almost straight up and down and I can take that and sweep it and make any kind of shape I want. This is a grind that Mark Chalet puts on his tools and there is a bevel to rub. rub it's just not very much of one. But you have really good control and you can do just about anything you want. I can turn, take this and turn it little tiny um, details <laughs> and turn females down to the size of a toothpick with this too.
Is that something different? No, it's not really a fingernail grind. All right, now, since I cut that away, you can see how these patterns stand out much better than if I had just left it. I'm going to go back with the skew and take a little more off this. And I think I'm going to go ahead and cut this on back here. Um, That's the nice thing about the lathe is you can make instant design changes. Sometimes by choice, sometimes not. stay horizontal like that, it needs to be symmetrical. <coughs> but if it's something that's going to be vertical, you do not want it symmetrical. And your eye will tell you it doesn't look right, even if you don't know why it doesn't look right to you. But if you get a chance to look at a, a canopy bed or something that's got turn, a lot of turn stuff on it, look, look at that and how the Patterns are different on the horizontal and vertical parts of it. It's nice to have nice, clean, fluid lines to your work. in there without supported by the tool rest and the bevel, it's going to do what it wants to do, not what you want it to do. So anchor it on the tool rest, A, B, put the bevel on it, and then C, rotate it into the cut. And if you do that carefully, you can go back and pick up a previous cut without leaving a single line. That's tell kill evidence. shiny here where I've been able to burnish it with a tool where I've just cut it. Just whatever. And hey, let, me, let me hit that with sandpaper just a little bit. I got some 400 here. And see how that builds up on the sandpaper? So you, you, you got to keep the sandpaper moving. And 
really going to work better if I power sand. <coughs> Piece of 220 here. Now I want the sandpaper. Now if this was a bigger piece, I'd have the blade turn way down. If I was doing my finished sanding, I'd have to. But I want to have the sandpaper turning in the opposite direction of the, uh, the wood. I'm going to reverse it over here. But see, by power sand, I'm not getting a buildup on one place on the sandpaper. of the puzzle. And I'll pass this around and I'm going to run to the restroom before I start on the next. Shake 
Yeah, one by eight. All right, let's get back started. It's not going to get to see the whole demo. Um, while I was on break, I was asked why not use a rag. The reason you do not use a rag is a rag has long, continuous fibers in there, and those fibers will catch in the wood and it will grab it and wrap up around in there so quick with your fingers in it that you won't believe it. But the paper towel has short little wood fibers in it, and they will break and tear off and not grab. And I'm going to make a lidded box out of this. And I've already taken and turned it around at the house. Uh, this drive I'm using now has a spring-loaded point in it. So it's really nice, and particularly if you're doing production work, because with the lathe running, you, you can put that there. Bruce. <laughs> between, between the centers, and, and then tighten it up, and you can switch pieces with the lathe running. If you're doing production work like Nick Cook does, it works really great. And what I did, I found the center, and I used a center punch, one of the spring loads center punches, and center punched the two points, put it on there, it's not screwed it up. And then I go with a ski rack. It moved again. Huh. Well, it go. 60 pound sledgehammer, somebody. Now, this is about the maximum diameter that you can safely use the skew. And the biggest problem people have with the skew is they let it slide down and get that point caught in there. That point is very valuable for making a cut like this, a V cut. You just keep going down in there and taking the wood out and do really nice decorations with it. You can use the other point, but then you got metal in the way and you really can't see what you're doing. And it's really good for. trimming off the end, but a spindle gouge works better. And how many people know how to use this? How many people want to learn? <laughs> Get the Allen Lacer video, the sweet and dark side of the skew. And that an Allen Lacer, by the way, will be at Highland next week. And he will probably tell you how to sharpen the skew and use the skew. But if you want to learn how to use it, it's the most versatile tool there is. Alan Lacer is the best teacher of it that I know. What I need to do now is uh, put a tenon on each side of this. Um, To put it in the chuck, and I'm going to use this. Now, it depends on whether your chuck is a dovetail on the back of your tool chain. Oh, yeah. And this one's got a real sharp kind of dovetail. So after I get it down to size, what I want to do is take the skew and undercut that just a little bit and put a little bit of dovetail on it. And then it's not going to come out of the chuck on it.
Any questions? Does anybody want me to pass this around? This drive? Everybody familiar with it? Jake, you call it a particular kind of walnut. What was that first word you said? Halo, C A L O. But I can't find that in my tree book. Uh, C L A R O. C A L A R O. Huh? Clara Wall? Yeah, Clara Wall. Isn't that what I was saying? C L A R O. All right, this has one of the plastic nope. rings on it. We're both left handed, we both can't spell. Sure. Which I don't particularly like. I like to get them almost on there, just give a little bit of sharp snap, and it locks them on there, and then just a little bit of sharp wrap. You put the tool there and just a little sharp wrap with a spindle lock, and it comes unlocked, but it's not going to come off while you're running the lathe. <clears throat> There's nothing worse than your big bowl and your chuck running across the room. Don't laugh, it, it happens. <laughs> well, that's how you go. Okay, now I want to divide this into two pieces. And what I'm looking for now is my grain character, which I want to try and make the two pieces match up. Right now it doesn't matter which is the top or the bottom. And it's really six one way, half a dozen the other. And uh, so I'm going to divide it right there. And I'm going to use this parting tool. This is a piece of a one inch bandsaw blade. It makes a nice thin part. And so I, I go straight in, but then I pull it out and I go in the same hole but widen it like like this to give me a little clearance inside so I don't get too much drag. It's mainly on the outside where I want it to perfectly line up. And I don't want to cut this all, all the way off like I'm doing it here because just wide enough I can see what I'm doing. I've got a three quarters of an inch left, I've got a half inch left, I got a quarter inch left. And now I'm gonna take a little back saw and cut the rest of the way through it. No you do not do this with laser on it. <laughs> now I got two pieces. You did? <laughs> All right, this is going to be my top. And I'm going to take this elbow scratcher out of here. And I'm going to take a spindle gouge. And I'm going to start hollowing this out. Just a little bit. Now I've got to put a mortise and tenon on here. And it really doesn't matter which one's which. So I'm going to put the mortise on this one. And put the tenon on the bottom. I'll have a question. Yeah. You're going from the outside edge to the center. But I see some going from the center and making a hole and coming out to the edge. You mean like this? Yeah. Either one works. Okay. Woodwork. <laughs> 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 George Blue has the best guess. All right, one thing you need to remember when you're doing something like this, as you get towards the center, the RPM stays the same, but the feet per minute decreases. And so you have to move the tool slower. 
and also it's better to leave a little high spot there in the center than a hole. If you make a hole to get rid of it, you've got to sand all the wood around it. But if you leave just barely slight high spot in the center, it'll sand right off. Now, I want to put a tin in here so the same tool that I made, this was a skew originally, and I ground it square and that's what I use to make my mortise and tendons. And that edge is perfectly parallel to this, and so I get this perfectly parallel to the lathe bed, and then I know I've got uh, a square tendon. And I want to get this a little bit higher, because I don't want the bottom edge rubbing, I want to be able to cut. Now I said I can cut in. Now this I can make any size I want. And then the other piece I match up to it. So now I'm going to come back and take that corner off there. And now I want to do a little bit of sanding. Three twenty and edge here when I did that and a little bit of round on that's going to be all right but I don't want that much so I'm going to go back and make that dress up that tendon disc a little I mortise rather just a little bit and then I also want this lip right here A little bit of bevel to it so the outside edge will sit tight even if I change the diameter the outside edge is still always going to be sitting down solid now use the same chuck, but since I got an extra chuck, this is easier. What kind of chuck is that? This is a Nova. Nova? Uh, first one I bought was a Nova chuck with the Tommy bars, and I found out I didn't have three hands, <coughs> and so when I had the opportunity to let somebody else have it, <laughs> I, I did so. All right, this is going to be the bottom, and here again we want to dish it out. How am I doing on time? About 25 a day. Oh, okay.
Thank you.